So the wonderful thing about this event every year is that it is um, always uh, one part reunion <laughs> for friends and family that sometimes don't get to see each other as often as they would like. Uh, nevertheless, because I am in the dean role, I'm going to just move it along <laughs> and um, call things to order. Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy to see you all here. My name is Melissa Gregory. I'm currently the interim dean of the College of Arts and Letters, which is the college at the university that's really proud to be hosting this event tonight. And I'm um, just delighted to open our program today with a few remarks about the history of the lecture, although before I go any further, um, I'm going to do just I have a couple of other things to say, which is one, to point out that the Mikhail lecture this year has gone green with an online program. So if you point your phone at that QR code that's on the poster outside, um, Ed, is that where it's located? OK. Um, is there one in here so people can see it? or? Um, OK. <laughs> we might do that and just kind of pass it around. Um, if you point your phone at that online program, um, you can access tonight's lineup of speakers, which is pretty simple. If you don't get access to the online program, you're going to be OK. Um, but you could also learn a little bit more about the history of the lecture. And if you are so inclined, make a donation to the lecture fund, since any contribution helps us to bring in the very high quality speakers we've come to expect from the um, annual event. So the next thing I'd like to do is to begin tonight's event um, officially by reading a land acknowledgement statement. So if that's new to anyone in the audience, this is a custom that dates back centuries in many native communities, and it's a way to recognize and honor the indigenous people who have been living and working in this area and on this land for centuries. So here is the university's uh, land acknowledgement statement. The University of Toledo acknowledges that the region of Ohio in which the university sits is the ancestral homelands of the Seneca, Erie, and Ottawa, as well as places of trade for indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Kilatika, Lenape, Kaskaskia, Kickapoo, Miami, Muncie, Peoria, Piankasha, Shawnee, Wea, and Wyandot. As steward of public lands, it's our responsibility to understand the history of the land the peoples who came before us and their continuing ties to this place. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. So now I would like to extend a very warm welcome to both our in-person audience and our many virtual watchers to the 2022 Maurice and Ramsey Mikhail Memorial Lecture. The Mikhail Memorial Lecture is an annual event made possible through the Maurice and Ramsey Mikhail Endowment Fund at the University of Toledo. This fund came into being thanks to a generous donation by the Mikhail family established over 20 years ago in June of the year 2000. The purpose of the fund is to support an annual lecture dealing with some aspect of Arab culture whether that's literature or music, politics, religion or economics, or any other aspect of life in the countries of the Middle East. In honor of Maurice Mikhail, who was a woman who believed in the power of education to bring human beings together into dialogue and compromise, the fund also prioritizes issues of peace and justice. We thank Maurice for the example she set in her efforts to create a more just and equitable world and for the legacy of Maurice and Ramsey together as a couple who lived the values of compassion, care, and mutual respect, and who honored the beauty and richness of their Arabic heritage. Now in 2022, the Mikhail Lecture is one of the oldest and most long-running funded lecture series in the College of Arts and Letters. The inaugural lecture occurred in 2001 and featured world-renowned linguist and cultural critic Noam Chomsky, and over the years, the series has hosted many well-known and thought-provoking speakers, including, but definitely not limited to, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, former Principal Deputy Solicitor General of the United States, Neil Katal, award-winning poet Moja Kaf, and many others. And if you go to the university's website, there's also a link to the private Mikhail Lecture website, which has the complete list of speakers, and it tells you a lot about them. So definitely check that out. The lecture uh, didn't miss a beat during COVID when we had to pivot unexpectedly to an online modality for a conversation with National Book Award finalist Leila Leilami, 
which was an experience that actually inspired tonight's hybrid format as we realized that we could reach beyond the confines of the physical campus of the university to deliver this free public lecture um, ab abroad, essentially. Um, again, our sincerest thanks to the Mikhail family, some of whom are with us here tonight and some of whom are watching online, for your generous gift to the university and for helping us to elevate the conversation about Arabic culture at the local, national, and even international level. So at this point, I'm sure you're really looking like forward to the main event and tired of hearing from me. Let me introduce um, Dr. Gabby Saman, who's going to be telling you a little bit more about tonight's speakers. Dr. Saman is Associate Professor of Arabic Language in the Department of World Languages and Cultures, as well as the Director of the Interdisciplinary Middle East Studies Degree Program. Dr. Saman is a communication and media specialist whose research and publications focus on intercultural and organizational communication. He's also one of our most popular professors with students who are always delighted by his enthusiasm and seemingly limitless energy. I myself have seen Dr. Saman playing soccer with students at the Rec Fit Center. He does not seem like he gets tired. So I encourage you to join me in welcoming Dr. Saman to the podium so that he can introduce our guest speakers tonight. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Gregory. And as she mentioned, we're here and excited because of our speakers. So I will be very brief. It's my honor to be presenting to our audience, whether in-house or on the stream, our two speakers for today. She was born and raised in Honolulu. What is she doing today in Hawaii? From Hawaii to Toledo in this weather? It's because she likes us, and she's going to talk about something that is interesting to us. Melissa Shimera is a descendant of Lebanese and Filipino background. She studied natural resource management at the University of Hawaii, and she worked since 1996 as a conservationist in a World Epic Center for plant and animal extinction. I never knew that artists will do research or the research based in whether it's humans or animals and other species would kind of be the basis and grounds their art, but this is what Melissa does. Her paintings and installations truly imply a sense of belonging for both marginalized humans and species alike. And her work has been exhibited in different places in the U.S in the Middle East and as well in Asia. Her exhibits are housed in the uh, Arab American National Museum here in Dearborn, just nearby, and as well at the Honolulu Museum of Art and the Hawaii State Foundation of Culture and Art. She has won many awards that would be too long for me to list if I said I am going to be brief. Because apples don't fall away from the trees, or as the Arabic idiom says, فرخلبط عوام, we can understand where Melissa gets some of her inspiration by knowing her mom, Adele Najain, who is a first-generation Lebanese-American. Adele is not too strange to a university campus. That's why, because she has been teaching poetry at university level since 1990. Probably she started when she was like maybe 20. Currently, she continues to serve as a professor emeritus at Hawaii Pacific University. And she's served as well as a poet in residence at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She has many published books. Among them is The Fieldwork and The South Wind which we may see outside of this auditorium later today. To give you a glim glimpse of her poetry, I'm going to quote a previous Mikhail lecture speaker, Naomi Shihab Nye, who I believe came and presented at this same lecture back, was it in 2003 maybe, or around four? Okay, Layla is saying it's 2004. Naomi said about Adal, from the jagged landscapes linking hearts and cultures, the rich mix of Middle East heritage transposed to Hawaii, images flutter, shine, and hold fast. 
there's a solitude here. You have walked into a forest by yourself and come across the tangled histories of everything you love. This gives us a glimpse of what Adele is going to walk us through today. So please welcome me, or join me in welcoming. You already welcomed me. Adele, Najame, and Melissa Shimera. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Just a, a quick moment to explain. We're going to be going a bit back and forth between poetry and art, and my mom will start um, with our thank yous and a few other things. Um, yeah, so I want to second that thank you to Dr. Simon uh, from me and Melissa. I know that I speak for both of us when I say to you that we are truly delighted and honored to be here tonight. We want to say a few more thank yous, especially to the Mikhail family and friends who we were so happy to have a little time with this afternoon, and to um, Dr. Samir. Um, we say a big thank you. Also to Dean Gregory and Dr. Lingen, and to the Mikhail, um Lecture Committee, and to all of those here at UT who've worked really hard to help us put this together. And I want to thank everyone here in the audience for sharing this time with us. As the title of our presentation indicates, this will be a selected retrospective of Melissa's work and mine and ours together in various exhibits. But first, I'd like to talk very briefly about two things. One, just a little bit of time about the business of making a poem. And secondly, I'd like to share a little bit of the family background that inspired both my work and Melissa's. First, about the business of making a poem. I write both lyric and narrative poems, and what I like to do most of all is combine the two forms. I'm sure you know that a lyric tries to capture the intensity, uh, the emotion, the intensity of a moment, and a narrative simply tells a story. Um, because some of the poems I'm going to share tonight have are, are very narrative, it's kind of easy to come to the conclusion that most of the content of these poems come out of family history. And actually, I wanted to say that that's not the case, that there are many elements that go into making a poem. Um, my family stories, the fragments that I've been able to put together in more recent years, certainly have influenced the content of my poem. But in addition to that, much is invented, imagined. Composites are used. I collected oral histories in Mount Lebanon in the villages when I was there on two occasions. And um, I also used source material. The imagination and the demands of the poem itself come into play so that poems often, often end up going in directions I never anticipated. In the end, as I've often said, poetry is about truth, not necessarily about facts. In fact, must, much has to be invented to produce the truth. The alchemy of many elements have to come together to produce a successful poem, one that has both depth and luminosity. There is a favorite poet of mine by the name of Linda Gregg, who's written a wonderful essay, a friend and a mentor, entitled The Art of Finding. And what she says is kind of a maxim that I subscribe to. She says, what I respond to most 
is what I find out or discover from the heart and the spirit, what we can possibly hear through language. Poetry makes us experience what we understand at its best when it's really good. We have an experience. Um, the intention of my poems is to bear witness, honor the sacred, and on some level achieve a kind of recovery. But I actually hope for more than that. I want to quote John Updike here. In a letter he wrote to a very good friend of mine about his short stories, he said, a short story for me begins in a personal experience or in imagining. The energy to write it comes from the sense that characters and situations stand for more than themselves. Without this feeling that you're speaking for more than yourself, most writers surely would not find the courage to go through the trouble of drawing up their evidence." End quote. All of that is to say that I hope our story, which includes some personal history about loss and recovery, as common as it is for all of those affected by the diaspora, is we really understand it's not only our story, that there are elements probably of your story in ours as well. My, so my hope is that our, what we share tonight will resonate for you. About the inspiration for our work, I want to talk for a couple minutes about my family background. I'm just going to give you a little bit starting with my father's story. He was born in Lebanon before the turn of the 20th century. He came to this country when he was very young with his parents, and he lived in North Adams, Massachusetts, and stayed there for more than a decade. During that time, many other children were born in the family. But my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, missed Lebanon so much, he just had to go back. And he did return just before the Great War started. But sometime before the war, my father, who was probably in his mid to late teens, returned to the US and lived with an auntie in New York. Then the war broke out. During the war, as I'm sure you all know, when the Ottomans sanctioned Mount Lebanon, tens of thousands starved to death or died of the Spanish influenza there, which included most of my father's immediate and extended family. But my father had no contemporaneous knowledge of his father's fate when he was here in the US. He joined the war effort by becoming an aerial photographer in the US Army Air Force in 1917. That's actually how he earned his citizenship. He was able, very early, um, at a very early age, to combine what he loved most, which was flying and photography. He only found out after the war was over about the deaths of his parents and five siblings. But he also discovered that two siblings had survived. He was able, after about two years, to locate them through the Lebanese Red Cross and bring them back to the US. After that, he continued his travels around the world for literally two decades. He didn't marry my mother till he was in his 40s. Um, what he did was aerial photography for the Dutch government. He mapped New Guinea in the early 1930s. He did a photo study for entitled Native Life in New Guinea for the Museum of Natural History in New York, which was published in their 1936 journal. And later, he did aerial photography for Standard Oil in South America and continuously traveled around the globe. But as far as we know, he never returned to Lebanon. I figured out much later in my life, because he died when I was quite young, that he must have had that restless spirit of the exile that Edward Said talks about. 
after he married my mother, whose parents were also born in Lebanon, um, uh, he, we, they, settled in New Jersey. And when I was growing up in a residential area in a town called Highland Park, I, I was utterly amazed by my father's love of the natural world. We had a half an acre behind our house in which he built a chicken coop for 500 chickens. My mother was not happy about that. And she decided to put an end to the raising of chickens when he typically would walk through the door after work at night and ask how the chickens were. She didn't like that. He planted grapevines along the entire length of the chicken coop. He planted grapevines, and in addition to that, every many varieties of plum, apple, and pear trees. Since he had been born in a village in the Shuf Mountains, Ma'as Yerushuf, when Melissa and I went to Lebanon for the first time in 2009, we took a side trip. We had been invited to the Sharjah Biennial. Um, it, was, it really was a pilgrimage. I knew nothing at all of my father's story when I was growing up. In fact, my mother had said, really warned me and my brother not to ask my father about his family. All she said was that they died and he was sad. So it's really taken a lifetime to piece together his story. But when we got to the Shuf and we saw the terrace gardens into the mountainside, and we hiked the cedar reserve in the March snow, being immersed in all that sacred natural beauty, it suddenly came together for me. His love of the natural world and ours, it was in his DNA and in his thousands of photographs, and it's in our DNA as well. Whether in New Jersey, Hawaii, or Lebanon, this attachment to the land was and is a very powerful motivating force of our creative work. And in this regard, Melissa's going to talk about our first international exhibit together. Thank you, Mom, for that wonderful introduction. And again, thank you to everyone here um, listening to our story. So just to give you some background, um, in contrast to my mom's upbringing, I was, as uh, Gabby had said, I was born and raised in Hawaii. Uh, where my Filipino dad was born and where my mom has lived since 1969. And to echo uh, uh, what my mom said about the love of the land, my career has been in natural resources management or forest conservation in Hawaii, where I've been working to conserve the lands, the waters, and the creatures on this most remote archipelago. We are the most isolated one in the world, 2,500 miles from anywhere. And um, I imagine that um, for many of us, Hawaii evokes the sort of tropical paradise, which of course it is, but it's so much more than that, as we were talking about earlier, Gabby. Um, as a lifelong islander, my home is both a place of inquiry and research as it relates to environment and culture. Um, Hawaii has these incredibly unique biological wonders, um, as such as on the previous slide, that Hawaiian honey creeper, which is found only in Hawaii. Um, and the archipelago, again, is also known as, unfortunately, an extinction hotspot for many of the creatures and plants. And of course, the native people have suffered terribly there as well due to the isolation. Um, so as a result of you know, coming into contact with so much rarity, I also began painting midway through my conservation career, nearly 20 years ago. Um, to document and catalog the rarest plants which you see behind me here in this painting, um, and the two paintings, um, native to Hawaii. And it was a few years later that my mother and I began our first poetry and painting collaboration in 2009 for the Sharjah Biennial in the United Arab Emirates. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that exhibition. It was an open call for projects, and we were incredibly fortunate to be commissioned among 50 or more visual and literary artists to create this collaboration called Inheritance 
land and spirit. And I'd like to mention that in preparation for this project, my mom and I hiked the Waikamoi Preserve that I helped to manage in Maui together up at 6,000 feet. Yeah, we do have a really tall volcano, <laughs> <laughs> which is cold, although it's not as cold as it is right now. Um, and we did that many times. Uh, we also shared ideas and hiked in the Lion Arboretum on the island of Oahu. And as you can imagine, this collaboration was really exciting for both of us. So for this project, I chose three Hawaiian flowers, including um, painted against a dark background, with two of them shown here, the Kokio Keo Keo, which is the white hibiscus there with the red stamen, um, and the Puakala, or the Hawaiian poppy. And as a conservationist, I had personally, sadly, witnessed the extinction of some of the rarest species in the world. And so I wanted to catalog these really culturally important rare species, as, as many of them as I could. And from that point on, I took my inspiration uh, for contrasting the species against a black background from the photographers David Lichwager and Stu Susan Middleton, who've put together an incredible collection um, called Witness, which um, highlight species of North America. And they do the same sort of technique of uh, species against black background. And this compositional device not only creates this sort of dramatic spotlight effect on the subject matter, but it also references that physical separation and fragmentation from the native environment that you know, a rare species, a native person, a refugee might endure. And these are themes that we will come back to get again, again, again and again later in our work. So for the opening of the biennial, we arrived here in Sharjah, which is the emirate next door to Dubai, and it's adjacent to the Arabian Desert. And the historic circle house that you see right behind me there with that beautiful stained glass also has this incredible traditional architecture where we showed our work. Um, and it's also really neat to note that it's in the Arts District, which um, for those of you who've been to Dubai stands in stark contrast to the skyscrapers and the man-made islands next door. So they're very proud of the heritage that they've managed to preserve in Sharjah. And um, what else do we have here? So um, Isabella Carlos, they're standing uh, right by the crate. She was the curator for the artwork of the Sharjah Biennial Nine, which of course included hanging my mother's poetry, um, or as they're called, broadsides, which were and are inspired by the plants and animals and landscapes of Hawaii. And there's my mom signing the poems. And I do love this picture because it shows how essential a good curator is. So the artist makes the work, and oftentimes we have no idea how to show it. Um, sometimes we do. Sometimes we have really strong opinions about that. But <laughs> that's where a good curator works her magic. And in this case, she placed the poetry beside the paintings, lining up the bottom levels so that the poetry on the left is beside the artwork on the right in this picture here. So this opens up the viewer to another art form where Hawaiians and flower, Hawaiian flowers and poetry bloomed together in the Arabian desert that year. And it was wonderful for us because it really gave the Emiratis there and others who traveled from all over the world to come to the Sharjah Biennial a glimpse into the natural world as my mother and I have lived it um, half a world away. And so next my mom will share two poems related to the Sharjah Biennial. Yeah, um, one of the three poems that were exhibited um, paired up with Melissa's paintings uh, is called Angels, a Living Hologram. And I'm going to read that in a second. Um, yeah, the title of our, our exhibit was Inheritance, Land, and Spirit. And this poem really is about spirit. It's a lyric, and I really think of it as an argument poem. And it begins with an epigram by George Eliot. Angels, a Living Hologram. We should die of the roar 
which lies on the other side of silence, George Eliot, Middlemarch. In the first light of morning, when the nesting birds in the flourishing poetry near my cabin return to their work with delicate intention, there is a gladness that radiates in the air, is carried by the power of the north wind that whooshes through the banana trees, through the white garden, heavy with scent, and on, streaming the circle of the earth, bathing the living and the dead, those who praise in one way or another, or would if they could. But what of angels? Some say they are as shattered mercury, each a living holy gram of the stunning whole and unseen creation, others just a reflection of our own desire. But in the heat of the day, they ate with Abraham under the oak trees of Mamre. Seraphim turned the fiery wheels of Ezekiel's chariot in Byzantine mosaics. They filled Blake's wild trees with wings of eyes, intoxicated Dante with streams of living sparks like rubies set in gold flooding the heavens. Chagall painted Jacob, wrestling one with women and chickens floating in the air around them wildly. Whether gifts or failure of gifts, darkness comes sooner or later. But until then, our thoughts make the world. The Dakini angel, beautifully rendered in the Tibetan thanka, guides the dying, light flaring from their skin, the roar on the other side of silence waiting for us. The next poem I'm going to read was inspired by an exhibit at the Sharjah Biennial. And um, one such exhibit that I found mesmerizing was called Faces by two extraordinary Lebanese filmmakers. That exhibit and another of a long neon Arabic script installation inspired the second poem I'm going to read in a minute, as well as some text from the artist's powerful book entitled Beirut Bereft. It also contains fragments of my father's tragic story as told to me by his one surviving sister very late in life. And this poem is called Faces Circle House Exhibit. And there is an epigram by the two filmmakers. In Beirut, we live surrounded by dead people looking at us. In Arabic, we say, hey, fina, they live within us. First, there is the terrible silence, then the sacrament, a visible sign of invisible grace, St. Augustine said, a way to discover the unknown when the pain is too much, when it burns the air around us. Or there will be 40 days of mourning, a modest affair, for many finally an image on a poster. Along a beautiful Beirut thoroughfare, for example, there are 42 lampposts and 42 frames with portraits fading out, ghostly silhouettes refusing to vanish entirely, a city, a, a harbor, a boat sailing away. Now standing before the walls of this gallery, I am struck by faces, the same face, frame after frame, progressively blurred, worn away by time, but still looking at us, the dead, the kidnapped, the missing. This is a city filled with portraits, the artist says, the living and the dead side by side. We wonder, with such mourning and commemoration, are the dead held up from deciding to retire? Can mourning ever be overcome? I am drawn back time and again, 
though there are 50 exhibits. Another, a floating installation of blue neon, huge and flashing, a full block long that scrawls Arabic script. It trails along the dark underground passage. I walk each day wondering what hard lesson is here for me. Again, I return to faces, feel the dead one's eyes beyond borders commanding my gaze, holding it. But no death portraits here, I think, of the seven in my family gone missing on the road from Beirut to Damascus. After so long deemed wartime casualties, nothing but thin air between the living and the dead, except a story a single surviving sister told me once. Picture a family, one of many thousands, rail thin and starving, when an empire having chosen the wrong side during the Great War was collapsing. They fled the high Shuf Mountains, walked across the desert, dreaming of date palms, a city refuge, but one by one they collapsed until only three remained. The sister, age nine, left to search for desert water. The older brother stayed behind near a great rock to protect the younger. Beautiful blonde boy, she said, with curls, four years old. But when the sister returned, somehow the young boy was gone. Must have wandered off when the older one fell asleep as the desert stars traced fire across a coal black sky. They searched and searched, calling his name for days thereafter, all their lives, really. Tried to imagine his life as someone else's son, someone else's brother. They published his portrait in newspapers that carried his face far across the Middle East. At last, she said, warring Bedouin tribes on horseback used to steal children in those days. The morning, the fear in her eyes, all that breakage, a whole litany of eyes caught in that lucid blue has us as yes sayers, though more alone than ever, speaking of our silent companions who like a shimmering fire in the bruised air are around us everywhere. So I grew up as my mother did with these family stories. And for me, it was imagining my great grandparents making these harrowing journeys that you just heard about. Um, and of course, you can see the newspaper clippings at the time my grandfather was searching for his family. They're pictured on the right. And you know, of course, it brings to mind that this could be headlines for today, right? Um, and I'll say that as um, someone interested in research, this has become a major component of any art undertaking. And it taps into my empirical interests in nature, which really wants all of the evidence that is known to us, whether that be the census records or the ship manifest or the fingerprint cards or other documents. And um, it's for me, it's more precise than those sort of coarse grain DNA analyses that just tell us what part of the world our ancestors lived in um, and traveled over eons. But these records, for me, actually show the events and the places where our recent ancestral memories are formed. And so, like forensics, they point to the jobs they held, the streets they lived on, the ports they entered and departed in, the names of they took and left behind, and the children who lived and died. So in my case, these fragments actually help shape my understanding of an incomplete narrative, which is always, as my mom was saying, a thing of near fiction and memory. So as I researched the public archives, I discovered these incredible refugee passport photos of my aunt Mulvina and my uncle Eddie, my grandfather, my Jido's um, brother and sister, in Beirut just after the war. And you can, of course, see the vacant looks on their faces as witnesses to just unimaginable things. Um, and it was from these actual photos that I created a portrait of my Aunt Molvina, 
which goes backwards and forwards in time, which I'll just show you the process. So the first image is of her portrait, and that begins with that painted one from the family photo that I showed you just a, a minute ago on the eve of the Great War. And then I printed my great aunt Malvina's refugee passport photo onto silk, which was transparent, and then stitched it onto the actual painted portrait. So what you're looking at here are two um, images right on top of one another. And then you also see there's this painted fig beneath her, which is a reference to the only food she was able to steal from the orchards. Um, other texts from her document are woven into, such like um, father deceased, forehead wound marks. These are actual physical things that they you know, recorded at the time she was traveling back to the United States. And finally, you'll see how I've also applied mulberry paper um, with the star pattern in reference to Njame, our family name, meaning little star. And in the background is her thumbprint, again, derived from her passport document. So this painting is called New Country, which is in contrast, of course, to the old country where that she and her two brothers left behind. And the word native actually comes from her passport, which refers to her native-born status, which ironically was the United States, a country um, that has, had never been new to her. And, oh, excuse me, I'm gonna go back. So now my mom's gonna read um, a poem inspired by these stories. Thank you, honey. Um, this poem is really about my Aunt Malvina's um, harrowing experience during the war. It's a long narrative poem and I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Um, I'm gonna pick up about halfway through the poem when she arrives on uh, a ship in New York Harbor. This poem is called The SS France and the Ruthless Furnace of the World. And it begins with a small excerpt from a newspaper. He first heard the fate of his family in March of last year when a cablegram announcing the death of seven of them reached him the day he returned from a year's service in uniform. The North Adams Evening Script April 17, 1920. After the ship arrived, the steward said, when she heard nearly all in her family were gone, some buried, some not, they found her asleep on the floor below deck, rinsed in her own tears. She had drawn a circle, a crude mother image, and fell asleep inside it. She said all her life vacillating between this world and that one, between oneself and the other, that she still longed for the high village, her father's orange and lemon groves, mornings with her mother by the fire, her brothers and sisters, the hardship and the abundance of it all. In the end, when I last saw her, an old woman, long widowed, we sat in her North Adams kitchen before dawn. She had fired up the cast iron stove, opened the oven door to a rushing wall of heat, and using the handmade breadboard, deftly slid the flattened rounds onto the heavy iron slab inside. The custom one, her Harry, she said, had made for her. In minutes, they puffed up paper-thin hollow steaming inside, straight out of the fire, she served them to me like that, small dishes of yogurt cheese and olives on the side. Eat, honey, eat, she said to me, watching closely and smoking a cigarette. Finally, in her strong, raspy voice, she said, when your father first saw me, he hoisted my leather satchel up over his shoulder and walked weeping to the rails of the ship to heave it overboard into the harbor. 
He held on to me as we watched it sink below the surface, as if that life might so easily vanish like that. The truth is, he never got over it. That's why he died young. Then all at once, she got up from the table, opened the heavy oven door, and facing the blue flame, began again. My aunt's parents' story that you just heard formed the basis for the next series of paintings which I created for the Ottoman Room within the Shangri-La Museum of Islamic Art and Design in Honolulu. And these paintings were situated, and in fi fact, um, it's worth noting that the Metropolitan Museum has a one like this there as well. Um, the paintings were situated in an actual room from Damascus, ba dating back to the period in which this tragedy took place. And the three oil paintings are on linen canvas. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I made them. Um, there are also some printed silk elements, uh, which include the native ibis bird, uh, which is from the region, and then clouds, all of which are stitched on the middle panel. And you'll see some close-up in just a second. But on all three paintings, you'll also see that I've um, applied this impasto, this thick, hardened crackle paste, uh, which adheres to the surface. And this patterned element serves as a mashrabiya, like the um, Arabian um, Islamic architectural de device which separates and obscures the figures. Again, it's the separation that I'm referring to, um, obscuring figures from the, the viewer. So one by one, the first panel here references my family's departure from uh, Mount Lebanon to Damascus. And my grandfather's mother and father are imagined to be up there in the um, upper section, having walked literally 19 days, as according to a reporter, um, to escape disease and death. And then my grandfather's sister, Julia, has died and is buried on the road to Damascus beneath a fig tree. This second panel is also an imagined scene. In this time, it's in Damascus. And my grandfather's siblings are beside today's South American refugees. Um, and again, the reference here is to those who walk similar fraught paths, both past and present. And in this case, the figures are entangled with Ottoman soldiers and then also today's US Border Patrol. And then this final panel depicts those fortunate enough to be on the other side of this gauntlet, either by birth or by fortitude. So I've titled all three paintings Borderlands, since it's a contemplation, of course, how civilians suffer the most um, by nations demarcating, drawing, and enforcing those boundaries. And so moving to the present, my mom will read two more poems based on our first trip to Lebanon, which again was quite a pilgrimage for us. Next photo. Yes, here you see the image of my father's village, Maasir. It's really interesting. I mean, it had been a hundred years, more actually, um, since my father left and Melissa and I visited this village. We had a black and white photo of this. And of course, this is a photo I guess you took, right? Uh, we were, I, I mean, I don't even know how to express in words what it was like to actually see it with our own eyes. It was remarkable to us. So Maasia, as Melissa has explained, is at 6,000 feet. It's the highest village in the shoof and sits right below the cedar reserve. Finding your homeland after a lifetime for us and I, I'm sure for many is a very complicated experience of both joy and sadness. It's a kind of recovery, but one that also includes a profound recognition of what you've lost, the other life that you might have had. Edward Said said it best when talking about the fate of the exile in ancient times. He said it was the worst catastrophe that could befall anyone to be cut off from everyone and everything beloved absolutely and forever. But he goes on to say that the intellectual exile suffering in the modern world 
is in some ways more exquisitely painful because we can return to what was lost, but we realize no matter what we do, we remain on the outside looking in and will never be fully at home anywhere. This is something I'm really sure my father must have felt, and I know I've lived with that feeling all of my life. The other image below is of our distant cousin, George R. Bede, who was our generous host and who took us to our family village. Um, as we were driving up the mountain, George warned us that more than half the homes in the village would be abandoned. Some would have their doors thrown open, others would be padlocked. Apparently during the Civil War on September 9th, 1983, there was a massacre in the village and many family members could not bear to return to where their loved ones, to their ancestral homes where their loved ones had died. All of that took place in a matter of just five hours. I'll read two poems inspired by going up to the shoof. This one is called A Shoof Lament. It's a lyric and it begins with an epigram after M. Darwish. A shoof lament, celebrate your land's spring and set yourself aflame like its flowers, after M. Darwish. You wonder what you will do without the cedars, the winding road up the mountain, even the vegetable stand on the side of it, with the young boy piling okra and green beans into his basket to sell there, his whole shoof life ahead of him at least you'd like to think. And what will you do without the almond tree and the mulberry in the March sun? And the mountain wind shaking everything here alive, the red earth, the red clouds moving over the village, terraced into the side of the mountain, the sun insatiable, and the hoopoe that flutters her way up through the red clouds to the snowy cedars, the blasted roses in the rock gardens that are gathered by the, the villagers and distilled into perfume to wash the bodies of the dead. This is what you find in the high places, the flourish of spring and the violence that hangs in the red air, the wind-blown cedars not far above the abandoned stone houses, Arabic script on a rotting windowsill, homage to the ones marched into a snowy field, their names inscribed on the wall at St. Michelle's, where William rang the bells beautifully one morning so that we might not forget for a moment how like the fields of the wild red anemone, we are waving our songs in the air before night falls. The second poem is also a short lyric, and it's entitled, My Father's Abandoned House in the High Village. The cold breath of earth whirling around us and every living thing, the windflower returning and returning to a fiery opal, that mountain, and not so far below it, a rusted gate padlocked. I managed to climb around it, walk the steep incline through a slope of budding fruit trees to the old stone house. Below its falling shutters, a stone planter to keep the scent of rose wafting through the bedroom where a man and woman slept, where children were born and lost, nobody knows how. The bulbs in the planter are about to break the heat of the black soil, pushed up by the wind fugue of this place as if in some kind of sad welcome. Let's see. So near Maasir, we passed Bedadine going up the mountain and just past Bedadine, but before Maasir, we saw an old silk dying pool. I, it was just breathtaking. And groves of mulberry trees where silkworms do their work. All this 
inspired Melissa's next two museum projects, which focuses on my mother's people from Maasir, Deir el Qamar, and Beirut. So here are Adele and Wadia, Ferris, and Jane, pictured here on their wedding day. And Adele and Wadia were first cousins married as teenagers after they immigrated from Lebanon to Massachusetts in the early 1900s. And like so many others, they were skilled tailors and seamstresses, as was common for Arab immigrants back then. And in fact, my great grandmother is wearing is made the dress that she's actually wearing, that beautiful lace collar, um, that handmade lace. And they worked in that textile industry, the center of which was in, globally, was in the northeastern United States. And as a tribute to them, I pulled out my own wedding gown, which began as a blank canvas, um, so to speak, which has been tucked away for 20 years, <laughs> and then brought it to life through the handwriting of my Tethys parents. And I reproduced their signatures from photographs and citizenship documents onto this mulberry paper and silk, which you can see here. And also my great-grandmother Adele um, at age 10 with this Arabic script written on the right side. So again, I was pulling from the archives or family photos to create something new. And after printing, I burned and purposefully distressed all of this material. Finally, I stitched that text as an applique onto the dress, which you can see in detail here in the train. And I called the dress, a wor The World is a Wedding, after Delmar Schwartz's so short story of the same name and my mother's poem about her parents. So you can also see this beading that I applied to the mannequin that wore the dress, which is my great-grandfather Eddie's signature from his citizenship document there on the right-hand side. Um, and then on the left is that Arabic script from Adele's photo, which says, this is our family photo, Hanin Shibli Ma'asrani. And so for me, the act of stitching and sewing is both this literal and figurative suturing of those fragments to create a family narrative, as so many of us do when we're reconstructing those memories and weaving together these fragments from our ancestors. The dress was first shown for an exhibition that I created and curated for the Arab American National Museum, not far from here, about an hour's drive, <laughs> in 2018, which was called The Far Shore. And that exhibition commemorated a centennial of the Arab diaspora to America um, since the ending of the Great War. And so for that exhibition, I brought together five contemporary Arab American artists and five poets, like Naomi Shihab Nye, the pictured there on the right with my mom, and that's Lena, I believe. Um, and I paired each artist with a particular poem, which served as a springboard for new artworks. Um, and, and those artists were just doing wonderful things, like reinterpreting this idea of shifting identities, wandering and homecoming, displacement, loss, longing, and recovery. And in doing so, these collective works, they traverse that incredible space between words and images. So for example, on the left, you can see here, that's Hayan Sherera. He's beside his poem, A Mother and Daughter, which is next to Reem Basus's um, painting called Echo. And once more, my mother and I presented our poetry and art together so they could be in conversation. Um, and that's so the uh, viewer could have that experience resonating between th these words and memories. And the gown appeared beside my mother's poem, Longing for Winter, which is really a tribute to my mom's great, or my great grandmother. Um, it's a sewing poem, which is a beautiful poem too. And that dress then made the return trip from Dearborn to Hawaii, this time to the Honolulu Museum of Art. And that was shown in a solo exhibition called Migrant. And this exhibition brought together both sides of my um, family, both the Filipino and the Lebanese side, um, as told through that public record that I was talking about a little bit earlier, um, as well as having references to endemic and introduced plants of various regions. 
So as to consider these ways in which ecologies and the environment shape our stories and ourselves. So next my mom will read a poem inspired by the village visits and the gown. Yeah, especially the wedding gown, I think. <laughs> this poem is called Stones Without People and the Art of the Mulberry. I was a piece broken off a rock, the only one in exile, with no relatives left, Hannah, Mina. Silkworms love the black mulberry, devour its tender leaves and spin their golden cocoons that hang from branches in the wind. It's a fast-growing tree, they say, 10 feet in one year. Imagine 43 million, most in the mountains of greater Lebanon. Then there's Ovid, who made the tree famous when Paramus and Thisbe, star-crossed lovers, took their lives under one. Says their blood turned the white fruit passion red. Ancient fighters inflamed their combat elephants by letting them just smell the wild berries. Now, in the flame of these waning summer days, I imagine those trees years ago in our backyard grove, mother working in the sun, picking the delicate fruit, eating some, her hands stained purple red as she filled her ba basket to make shirab el tout for guests, she would say, should any pass by unannounced. The fruiting season is short, she would say, allowing us to long for them the rest of the year, which is to say she blessed the fermenting desire that blazes up in us during a long absence. Keep the red berries with the black for their sharp flavor, she would say, sliding them into a muslin bag and pressing the juice into a pot. Strain, add sugar, and boil. Don't stop stirring or you will have a mess. Then cool and store. Add one table syrup, I'm sorry, add one tablespoon of syrup to a tumbler of ice water and serve to your guests on hot summer days under shade trees. Remember, listen to their stories. This is a gift. Hold your mother words, you think to yourself, a voice, an apparition you will run after when your days become a broken, stony field. Now, your artist's daughter, here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, orders mulberry paper from the old world and sheets of silk to transform her wedding dress into a flame of memory. She burns Arabic names and phrases from old passports and the backs of photos to applique onto her gown, mulberry black and blood red, a museum piece igniting the fire of retrieval in our hearts. We know bait means both home and family in Arabic. Abandoned homes are spoken of as stones without people, which is to say departure and perpetual flight are like the hot windstorms that sweep over us from the Egyptian desert, the oppressive Khamasan, a, wind, a requiem of wind, a wind that can break nails, they say, a wind like a blade wiped clean, leaving only a wall of dust behind. Yet during our last slow days, when the work of grieving, that song, follows a waning moon in the cool breeze of our dark nights, we hold on as best we can to those still glowing here or not. Thanks, Mom. Um, so these are pictures are of my mother's um, parents when they were young. That's Genevieve, my Taita, and Nash or Najib Najem. Um, and that is my Taita on her honeymoon in Cuba, and who I was quite close to when I was young as the one grandchild who is most interested <laughs> in the history of our family, asking questions of her. And although I never got to know my Jido, uh, since he died when my mom was young, young 
I came to understand that, like so many people in the world, um, that they had experienced this intergenerational trauma of violence, of death, of separation, endemic to the region at the time, especially, all of which I imagine they struggled to leave behind, forget, and create a better world for their children. Which leads me to their twin portraits in the painting, Turn Your Back, um, of both Nash and Genevieve, which is in the Arab American National Museum's permanent collection. So the damask floral patterns in the background, again, they're painted onto linen canvas, which is a sewing reference to Genevieve's mother, Adele Faris Maasrani, pictured here in silk beside her. And this painting was first shown in the exhibition, Let There Be Spaces in Your Togetherness, which is such a beautiful phrase, uh, that was sponsored by MISNA, the Journal of Arab Arts, and the Sioux Visual Arts Center in Minnesota. So 20 of us, four of us artists who identify as either Southwest Asian or North African exhibited our works collectively together which is a beautiful thing because we were reinterpreting, just by our geography, we were interpreting, reinterpreting the definition of what Arabness, in quotes, might be. And so here's a close-up of where you can actually see the stitched silk portrait on the left of my great-grandmother's wedding picture I showed you earlier beside a, that port painted portrait of her daughter. And unlike Najib, who never spoke of his family tragedy, um, Genevieve's mother, Adele, told her stories all the time. And my great-grandmother, for example, was 12 when she sadly witnessed the murder of her own mother, Sadie, while she was protecting her teenage son in a street fight in Beirut. And above her daughter's head are these um, photographs of knives, which are sewn onto her portrait, and that those knives actually come from a, a <laughs> photograph of <laughs> my grandmother as a very young child, probably three or four, beside her brother, long, beautiful curls, and her father told her brother to hold the knife to protect her sister as a toddler. That was incredible. Um, and then on the right there, of course, is Najib in front of the star or the symbol of the Ottoman Empire, the destruction of which consumed his family and which I imagine he's just struggled to leave behind. That grapevine and the Hawaiian pool cauliflower, which has appeared in many of my other paintings, is that new life springing forth beside him. Next, my mom will read two poems about her parents. Yeah. Thank you, honey. Um, this poem is for my mother, and it's uh, a narrative poem. And uh, again, fragments from, of stories I heard when I was young. It's called Through the Holland Tunnel. And there's a quote from Rainer Maria Rilke, who I adore. I have only this one dress. It grows thin and it turns pale, but it will keep an eternity, even before God, perhaps. Song of the Orphan, Rainer Maria Rilke. She drove the Oldsmobile 98 hulking behemoth. She worked the night shift at Squibs to buy like she was born to do it. Took the long, narrowing curve fearlessly though she was only weeks at the business of driving. A child, it seemed endless to me and dangerous. Huge trucks barreling alongside us, the Hudson above. I waited for the walls to cave. But mother, resolute, accelerated like a pro so that even the truck drivers gawked, gave a thumbs up as we shot past. That sure look in her eyes, a gift, a child's lifelong salvation funneled straight into the bloodstream, <coughs> excuse me, that moment. <coughs> we would get through the tunnel that day, and many days like it, head up the gridlock of Canal Street and over the Brooklyn Bridge to where Margaret, a cousin like a sister to her, lived in a three-flight walk-up they would call out to each other, window to street, back and forth, 
in two languages, love scattering like shower trees in late summer, shedding storms of blossoms into the city air. Mother would open her tin of homemade betlewa while Margaret hurried to boil Turkish coffee, her gold brace jingling, bracelets jingling as she worked. They were joined at the hip, those days invincible. They had lived through the great crash together, a father's mad impulse to burn down the summer house he built in the country, a great conflagration for a fresh start in Miami. All the bushels of canning put up in quart jars, peaches and dark plums exploding in the fire. Both had lost husbands young and raised children alone. And later, when the floods came, the money they salvaged from a muddy cash box was left to dry on a grassy hillside. They hung their white dresses, I'm sorry, they hung their wet dresses over the low branches of a pin oak. Swallows and fine dresses in a tree, she would say, until a great wind came up all at once and swept them away. You should have seen it, she would say, birds and red dresses flying in the wind, swept up into the black clouds, then gone in a blink of an eye, just like that. The second poem I'm going to read in this area of mom and dad poems is one for my father. And um, it's called Grief, a Revolving Landscape. Um, I'm thinking of a conversation that we had at lunch today, which was lovely, and how, and, and I was able to share one of the wonderful insights about Robert Frost when I was teaching poetry all the time. I, I would tell students what he would say, and he always said that a poem begins with a lump in the throat. And he said, if you find the world confusing, make something. Create order out of disorder. And, uh, the, you know, I kept that in mind when I was trying to write this poem, which is a long narrative poem in which I try to imagine my father's early life up in the village. Grief, a revolving landscape. Dreaming in Arabic, flying red clouds, hang over the high shoof village. A young boy dresses early by lamplight, does his morning chores in the cold sun, leaning heavily into the cedar wind. He lugs firewood into the kitchen to keep the heat going. In this dream, his parents live. His sisters have long, dark hair. They sweep up into heavy braids. Julia, the young one, wears olive wood beads and carries buckets of rainwater to the garden while their mother steams milk with cardamom and sugar for them. In this dream, they live to grow up, marry, even have children of their own. In this dream, the boy is not yet a grief-stricken survivor of war. Village gunfire has not done its work. The blades of their neighbor's knives have not slashed the throats of their goats in the fields or those sleeping in their beds. He does not hear their stiffening cries. The house is not yet stone vacant, and the front gates are not yet chained up and rusting in the rain. What does this have to do with any of us as I climb that mountain in the March snow far into the future, see those terrace gardens that will bloom half a world away under the shining red clouds? Our questions are locked up in those walls in that village, but not so amorphous grief. It keeps moving like pollutants carried by ocean currents that fill estuaries and streep and seep into groundwater. Our bodies mark it in a hundred ways, the Sirocco storm of it, the empty boat of it. There is the beaten down slouch 
of the shoulders, the wheels of her own night terrors like blue smoke. Under the microscope, the landscape of our weeping, our dried human tears, mostly crystallized salt in extreme detail, they tell us, a landscape different from all other tears, different from the ones shed in joy or fear, our emotional terrain cataloged. More than that, the sum of our collective human experience. And dried there, too, in Kefalins, the body's narcotic, a natural painkiller, a moment of sweet rescue, if only we could live on it, or rest at will, the way a cat blinks away the world when it dozes on a windowsill in the sun. Years after the boy's exile, another life of absolute silence spent in that holy city of grief where you know you will lose everything, I say, finally, I live there with you, Father. Saw the daily labor of your morning, carried it with me into the fu future, back to the huge Beirut air. It rose up from me like a cloud of fog and settled heavy again when I found your vacant village home, climbed the rusted gate to the terrace gardens you tended, sorry, and where suddenly I saw an almond tree sure to blossom again into darkness, and, <clears throat> and where the red poppies in the wind you loved, already budding, had broken through a drift of blinding snow. <laughs> See, where are we? I kind of lost it there. Finally, <laughs> uh, that's a hard one. Um, finally, we've talked a lot about loss, something familiar to all of us who have spread out over the world. But recovery, as I mentioned in the poem, is more amorphous than loss. It's harder to nail down and harder to hold on to. For us, though, finding the remnants of my family's life in our visits to Lebanon is a kind of recovery. I had thought setting foot on Lebanese soil would put an end to the longing I felt all my life. And it was life-changing. But it only opened other doors to more questions and more longing ad infinum. Imagining and creating is another vehicle of recovery, certainly for me and for Melissa, but there are other small kinds of recovery that come by the ways in which we manage to honor our family members and the gifts that they gave us in whatever way we can, cherishing the language, the food we cook and love to serve to others, through the customs and etiquette that we observe, and certainly through a deep reverence for the land and the natural world, wherever we are. Thanks, Mom. So i just like to add here that as we close, um, making these connections with family, even those that you haven't met, for me, my great-grandparents, my Jiddo, has been the most wonderful part of collaborating with my mother as a poet and artist. Um, and even as generations removed from the old country, diving into our oral histories and the public archive, again, brings me closer to our culture and language that sustains me as a descendant of immigrants and as a way to share those intimacies with the world. And we are so delighted to have done so this evening. So the last poem for this presentation tonight um, it's a bit happier one, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's entitled, uh, and it's dedicated to Melissa. And I guess I wrote it after my first trip to Lebanon. Um, it's entitled, Missing Rose Beirut. And I think the end of this poem just tries to capture a small moment of recovery and how beautiful that can be. It's called, Missing Rose Beirut, a Région poem 
I know I probably didn't say that very well. It means we are returning, and that's a typical form of poetry um, for, for Lebanese poets, for Melissa. When you wake, first thing, that dreamy moment before clarity hits, you think you will rush outside into the blustery wind, past the open markets, crate loads of oranges and lemons piled high, rush pa past buildings blackened from bomb fire, the dead weight of bereavement next to the glamour of the new, the frenzied catching up, some say, the deliberate forgetting, averting your eyes, and having learned to negotiate broken concrete, you will make your way to a corner cafe crowded with outdoor tables. You will hear a flood of Arabic, French, English suddenly in one lyrical flutter and be instantly transported back to your growing up, the music doing its work. You will order Arabic coffee, sit a long while as Beirutis rush by, the women in their high heels and tight jeans, long hair and wool scarves flying in the March wind. You will find the constant clog of traffic, even the noise of Hammer's crowded streets, strangely fascinating until you are startled back by a handsome gentleman rushing toward you, rather toward the man sitting nearest you, his overcoat flying open in the wind as he calls out, Habib Elmi. And when he locks his arms around him with kisses right there in front of us all, this is the moment it will hit you. Recovery has nothing to do with will. That it is sweeter and unexpected, like being caught in a sudden downpour on the hottest day of summer. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
When I was young, all we did was visit family members, and they would tell their stories. My father was the unique one. He never spoke about his family, but my mother's side of the family, um, you know, happy and sad stories were told constantly. We didn't have a TV until I was 10. Wow. So I, I felt like, uh, I mean, I just felt like I was the keeper of the stories, and I am grateful for that. That's awesome. It, do you think that's it's like a generational trauma, maybe? Like it was not spoken about from their father's side, or uh, was it meant to be not spoken about, or was it like a trauma sort of um, experience that he went through? I, I really don't know the answer to that question. I think my, well, I can talk about it. I don't mm -hmm. know if I can get at the heart of it. My father never spoke of his loss, ever. Yeah. He died when I was 15. He had a sudden, very sudden heart problem. Um, I, I know that he was traumatized, and I think that, he, that the silence represented that trauma. My maternal side, everybody talked about everything, you know? <laughs> My grandmother would weep when she would tell the story about how she saw her mother at age 12 wow. uh, die in a street fight in, in Beirut. Um, I believe, I have come to believe that there is generational trauma. I think I feel it, too. It, although too. I never experienced it personally, but I think it just flows in the bloodstream, you oh know? Wow. And um, I think, you know, that started when I was very little. My family members all spoke Arabic. Mm. My parents stopped speaking because my, couldn't, my brother couldn't speak English when he went to school. Mm -hmm. But um, we were just, you know, and they spoke in Arabic and English, and I, I, I just internalized those stories, and I... I yeah, they, I just It was like a shock. Them. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for answering. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, uh, thank you for not lecturing to us about the history, how, and, and directly telling us, but you did that through art and poetry that walked us through the same experiences that many of those early immigrants went through and what their generational offspring are going through now. Do you see that the same experiences might be going through the heads and lives of refugees today, disregarding whether they are from the Middle East or from Ukraine or from Russia, and all of those who are going through almost similar experiences? Sure. I have really been interested in that question, um, Gabby, about these incredible similarities from people who are uh, economic refugees or political dissidents. And I've interviewed all of those folks on the Filipino side. And there are incredible um, commonalities there that I think most of us can imagine, you know, leaving everything, your home, Every, your language, your culture, family members um, behind, and um, that displacement, that separation, and my field of interest has been in trying to figure out where and how people negotiate their identity in a new situation, and, and it's, there are so many different answers to that, but getting to the hard part of it, yes, absolutely, um, you know, you the same stories from before are today, are now. Absolutely. Yeah, Syrian refugees. I mean, I spoke with a man from the Philippines who had to leave because he was helping people who are landless there through aid organizations, and his wife was murdered by the Philippine military, and his children begged him to leave so they wouldn't become orphaned, and I mean, now he is trying to make a new life. So, yeah, they're not unique to our people. They're not unique to our time. We just keep seeing these stories again and again, and especially with the hardening of borders, right? I mean, we saw how the Middle East was cut up in sections, and we all know about that, but 
you know, now with nationhood and nation states, it's really becoming much more hardcore um, everywhere. So it's not only, you know, people fleeing wars, which are traumatic and horrifying, but it's also economic, too, um, and political. So I have a question that has been texted to me from someone who's <laughs> watching. Okay. Um, as a follow-up to the question of the personal in your work, how do you think about the relationship between individual narratives and the larger sociopolitical realities in which they are implicated? As in, the relationship between a, a I can never say this word, aestheticizing, the aesthetics mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. of personal narratives in times of fraught and dangerous politics. How do you think about how family history speaks to contemporary events? It's a big, big question. Yeah, Lots of that's Absolutely. my whole um, reason for being, really. <laughs> Um, I like to, I think my practice, you've seen there's a lot of beautiful imagery and patterns. I really do like to draw people into this layered, contextualized situation, you know, and I'm not a documentary filmmaker, and so it's really trying to convey a certain point of view through mm. that personal lens to give, you know, just agency to people who don't otherwise have it in these situations. And so for me, it's going to create empathy, I hope. Um, and as I've said many times in other venues, I, I don't ever imagine that looking at a painting is the same as the, the hard social justice work that needs to happen and the economic reforms that need to happen. I don't try to confuse the two things, ever. Um, they're, inde they're different endeavors, and they both need to happen. But I do think we can create narratives, we can create new imaginations, and imagine a different future, and you know, if someone can stop in front of my painting or listen to a poem and have a feeling and a reaction, even if it's for 30 seconds, hopefully it's for longer, <laughs> I feel like maybe I've I've helped out in, in a particular way. But I, I really do think, you know, if we could just open a novel and then change everyone's mind forever, the work would have been done. But there's so much hard work out there, as we all know, and, and we need everything, every tool in the toolkit. Yeah, I'd just like to add very briefly that there's a school of thought that, you know, that maybe we shouldn't be writing poetry, that it isn't going to you know, save lives or stop war or create you know, social justice. Just, um, but my personal belief is that it's life affirming to call attention to what is wrong and to try, as Melissa said, to engender understanding and empathy and we you know we can only do that one person at a time with whatever our strongest beliefs are but i i think that writing and creating art is a life affirming thing to do and we feel compelled to do it you know otherwise <laughs> you know why why do it if you don't have to do it it's it's not easy you know I think we have time for one more question, if anybody has. Uh. Um, my question might not be as uh, deep as some of the other ones <laughs> that have been said already. Um, but for families who are, you know, third, fourth, fifth generation uh, immigrant descendant, um, so many of those stories are becoming lost or faded. Um, what's the best step to reconnect to those stories and those paths, and how do we uh, uh, get back to those origins? Yeah. That's a great question, because I was so curious about all the things that you mentioned, and I don't have that complete record. None of us ever will, and there are things we just can never know. But there's a lot out there. There's a lot in the public record. I mean, truly, I found those pictures of my great aunt and uncle on Ancestry.com. I couldn't, I was sh in shock. I mean, I was starting to get to know where they were at different times, so I could look through some of those passport photos. So I, I was, I 
did a lot of digging. I spent years looking for this information. But then there's also these incredible fictional, nonfiction stories from all people from all walks of life that are, again, you know, there are these commonalities for people who just made these incredible journeys that many of us can't even imagine from the past and from today. And, and the connecting with those stories is just really powerful. Doing whatever you can to figure out, like, you know, where your family fits in or where, you know, people you care about fit in. And then, you know, reading from the point of view of all kinds of other people is really, it's really wonderful. Okay, well, let's all tell Adele and Melissa, thank you so much for such a beautiful oh, presentation. Thank you thank all you so much. much. <laughs> and um, they're going to be right outside at a table in the raised area over here, and uh, there will be books. And um, so feel free to go out and talk to them. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>